welcome back to Sound Insulation Store. We're back in our little demo studio booth set up in the corner of our warehouse here in Liverpool. And we have got a guest joining us today who is Jonathan from Peninsula Acoustics. He's an acoustic consultant. Um, he's extremely experienced, which is hard to believe for how young he looks. Uh, but he has a lot of experience in acoustic consultancy. But today we're going to be talking about sound insulation because we are the sound insulation store and we're going to be particularly talking about the passage of sound and how it relates to what we do and to our products. So, hi Jonathan. Hello. Let's start with a really broad question. Tell us how sound relates to the building regulations and what is party of the building regs? Very broad question, but part of the building regulations, the latest regulations is the 2003 version. That was updated from the previous 1991 version. It was an enhanced coverage of what was, what was included within the regulations. You have E1, E2, E3 and E4. E1 covers, if you like, the separating structures between dwellings and communal areas or adjoining buildings, it describes. E2 is more along the lines of internal floors and walls. E3 is basically through the reverberation time in communal areas. And E4 is acoustics in schools, because the building regulations also cover schools as well as residential. The, main, the, the biggest change really was the introduction of sound insulation testing for the separating floors and walls between dwellings to demonstrate compliance with the performance standards in Document E. Um, you can see the sound insulation kit in the background, which is used as part of a test procedure to demonstrate the compliance. Our clients who are uh, building flats and houses with party floors and walls need to be aware that there's a pre-completion test procedure. And it is a test where you either pass or fail and you either achieve building regs or don't. Isn't that right, Jonathan? Completely. A good, a good approach to this is to ensure you're getting the right advice at the start and building structures that give you a little margin above the regs, a little comfort zone, because there may be the odd, you know, the, maybe the odd issues during construction and you don't want them to affect the, the final result. Yeah, absolutely. You don't want to be on a borderline specification and come into that pre-completion testing. Your kitchens are in just before your floor finishes. Yeah. And you don't want to be a situation where you're crossing your th fingers, hoping that you're going to pass your test. It's very common to, to, for people to, to, to say to you that they want the cheapest system possible to meet the regulations. They want to buy the minimal amount of materials to meet the regulations. In a lot of cases, you want them to find the best way, the most cost effective way for your construction type of what you're building but with giving you a margin, a comfort margin as well, to ensure you meet the regulations. It's gonna cost you more having a failed test, fixing it, than it is putting the right construction in place in the first place. Yeah, and it's not always about the materials as such. It's often about how it's installed, how they go together, what type of voids you're building, how you're working with your junctions. It's not all about buy the most expensive products and put them in and it's going to pass. It's, it's, a, it's a balance, isn't it? It's a very big balance. Installation is critical. One of the most common problems you come across, a reg regular problem, is the fitting of resilient bars in both floor and wall structures. The number of times over the years where you've gone to sites where the wrong screw size has been used and the resilient bar has been poorly installed and simple precautions, you can get whole blocks of flats all complete that are all failing because of the wrong screw size. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit more about that test procedure. You've got an airborne sound requirement performance standards, and you've got impact sound performance standards. Airborne sound, you know, the speech frequency is us talking now is airborne sound. If we use an example as a block of flats, for the airborne requirements, you'll have to achieve the airborne performance for the separating floor, but also the airborne performance for the separating wall. The impact sound test is just on the floors. Now that would typically be footfall noise from above. So you're testing the vibration transfer through the floor in an audible sense. We've got the speaker here you can see as part of the airborne test. 
and the tapping machine, which is down here, is part of the impact test. So you've got two flats here, one above the other, and it might be we're doing a test between bedrooms that are stacked above each other, or living rooms. We typically test from the larger volume room to the smaller volume room. Let's, let's assume we've got a nice big bedroom upstairs, and we'll call that our source room. So we would use the speaker to set a noise level within the room, or what we call a diffuse field. We're testing across a frequency range between 100 hertz and 3.15 kilohertz, and we get a nice level field, approximately speaking, 100 dB across the range. We will measure that, and then we'll measure the difference in the receiver room, so we'll measure what's getting through the structure to below. There are some additional measurements of reverberation time and background noise levels to correct the figures accordingly. So that's the airborne test, and you say across the frequency range, so in really basic terms from real low bass and frequency to really high pitched frequency, is that right? Yeah, that's correct, you're in third octave bands, which are, so 100 hertz, 125, 160 hertz, you will class those as the lower end of the sound test, whereas you will go up to, you know, 2.5 kilohertz or 2,500 hertz, 3.15 kilohertz, which would be a higher frequencies. What about the impact test? It's a different procedure. Yeah, the impact test, so obviously we're using the tapping machine, which you can see here, and it's a set of hammers that hit the floor. So we used the example before between two bedrooms that were vertically stacked. The tapping machine will be on the floor upstairs, and the hammers will be hitting the floor, and you're measuring the level that is received downstairs. The hammers are set weights. It's a calibrated set of equipment, so you're introducing the same impact on every floor you test, and then you correct the level with reverberation time and background measurements to help check the background isn't affecting the result and then you'll end up with your single figure result just like your airborne test. So on an airborne test you're measuring the difference from one flat to another Yeah. and on the impact test you're measuring the level in the room below. Yes, that's right. So you mentioned previously of different requirements within Document e for new build and for conversion. So is there a different approach you take to when you're designing and specifying acoustic systems for new build and for conversion properties? From a new build design, um, obviously there's no building there. So it's very, it's very much a desk-based design, um, you know, with architects' drawings and all their sections, elevations, their proposed details. You can work from the details and provide appropriate floor and wall constructions and junction details to how the floor links with the external wall, with the separating wall, with the internal wall, so sort of that blank canvas to start from and you can get all the junctions right. From a conversion perspective, you've got an existing building. And the biggest problem with an existing building is actually knowing your starting point, knowing what's there. If you're converting a building into a number of flats, you could have some existing constructions that would already meet the requirements. In certain cases, if it's possible, you might try and test some elements before you construct or before you specify to know your starting point. Maybe a common misconception is that it's a lot easier to pass a sound test on a new build because, as you say, you're designing it from scratch. But the change in the fabric of buildings and building materials has really changed the way that sound travels within a building over the years, would you not say? Within new builds, the drive has been for lightweight building materials. Old housing stock and old buildings, everything was all high mass and heavy. And I think the best example we can use is external walls, nine inch brick walls, yeah, solid, solid walls, brick. lots of mass. Whereas in new builds, typically we're building out of, you know, we've got all the thermal requirements of Partow and the designers are encouraged to use lightweight block work. Though our new builds, have to achieve higher standards, for example, as an airborne result of 45 dB DNTW plus CTR, and our conversions have a 2 dB relaxation to 43. The actual starting point in a lot of cases with the high mass solid walls is, a, is, is much more beneficial. So following on from that point, um, a very common term used in, in our industry is flanking noise. You talked to us a little bit about flanking noise and how that causes issues within construction, particularly in new build. Basically what flanking is, is the sound bypassing the structure that you've constructed. So if you built a separating wall, you came to test it and it was failing, it might not be the wall itself, it might be the sound 
bypassing the wall via the, the floor it's built off, the external wall it junctions with, or it might be going over the top rather ceiling, ceiling or roof structure depending on the location of the wall. Yeah, the issues that we come across is if you actually flip that over and if, if we're looking at flats, the flanking issues down walls through the structure of the walls because yeah. you could have an amazing robust ceiling system and a really high performance acoustic floor system but the flanking can come down the walls because of the lightweight elements we've been talking about. Yeah, traditional build is a good example. So in traditional build where you had timber floors and masonry cavity walls, the way everyone likes to build your typical house, you try to build that in a flat sense. And what happens is basically your timber floors are built off the continuous inner leaf of block work that runs up the building. You've got this continual wall bypassing your floor so you might have this really good floor construction, but the en the energy of the sound when you come to do the test is within the walls and run and bypassing the floor. And typically building regulations would require you to build an independent wall lining above and below, mineral insulated, high mass blaster board and what have you on an independent stud. Yeah, there's examples here. So that would effectively reduce that flanking path. Uh, we see this as a really common issue and this is another reason to have an acoustic consultant on your project from the start because it can often be overlooked in the design element when you can think that you've really designed well to party having a floor and ceiling spec in but if you've not looked at the flanking elements it can often cause issues uh, pre-completion yeah completely what i mean one of the best examples is is in conversions of existing buildings and it really highlights the issue where you may have an existing building with all the high mass brick walls all around um, and effectively they're converting into a number of flats but they've built an extension on the back of the building with out of lightweight block yeah. work which is continuous so you've got high mass brick walls and then you've got lightweight thin block walls that are running yeah. continuously and people put the same floor construction in same ceiling same ceiling construction floor to ceiling same constructions and it passes in the old building and fails in the new building because they haven't considered the flanking sound paths absolutely when you take on a client who's got a new project and you're asked to come up with a design um to achieve party what are your initial considerations what are the first areas that you look at it's all about understanding your starting point if you're in a new build, it's about understanding the basic build type the client would like to go down. So if you're building flats, you know, are you going with concrete plank floors? If it's you know, is it a concrete plank building or make with masonry walls, is it in situ concrete? Is it beam and block floors or is it timber floors, timber frame? There's many ways you can do the same thing, but understanding the starting point will lead you down which materials that you would use. And how, and how you would design that building. But you've also got to look at the junctions and really get into the, the nitty gritty of those, those details. Completely. It's about making sure you're correctly building the right elements first before certain junctioning elements, depending on the details. So what, when you do see failures or when you're appointed retrospectively to try and help a client get over, you know, a failed test and to try and put that correct, what are some common areas that you do see failures on? We touched on resilient bars earlier on. A good system might be installed, but the resilient bar might be fitted incorrectly. The resilient bar is there to decouple the ceiling from the structure above. You do tend to get like a flexible ceiling. And if the screws have been fit, fit through the plasterboard layers direct into the joists, it's made it very rigid mm. and that flexibility is gone and it reduces the performance in the lower frequencies of the sound that we, that we cover within the sound test. That's a common, common failure. How do you investigate that? Without being destructive, obviously you've got your graphical data and your understanding of construction and typical failure, so you've got an, a good understanding of the data you've taken from the test. But also, just quite simply by putting your hands on the ceiling and push it, you, know, you can see if it's flexible or rigid. You can also potentially, which I've done in the past, is pull a down lighter out and basically put a little camera through the hole and take photos using a boroscope, take photos of the, of the resilient bar fitting and demonstrate the screw fixings. So there are ways you can investigate to find, that, find what the issue is. 
Yeah, and it can really be as simple as that, as using the wrong depth screws. Yeah. The client can say, but we built it to the spec. We've got the resilient bars in there, but there's very little margin for error in a standard resilient bar. They have to be installed exactly right or they're completely compromised. Absolutely. It's all about control of the installation. The right screw sizes might be getting used, but you can't do anything about the, the guy who's just run out. And, he's, and he happens to have another bag of screws, just ha- just happens to be in his toolbox next to him. And next minute he's using them. I think it's important to understand if, if any of us were putting a ceiling up, we're putting a ceiling up primarily for it to stay up. One of the problems with the resilient bars is the flexibility of them on installation. As in, as you're fixing them up, the bar is bending mm. and that promotes this problem. There's different types of resilient bars out there that I would say are a little bit more robust. Yeah, so we've got the maxi resilient bar that's fixed either side. It's got a deeper void. Or we also have the clip and channel systems of the Genie Clip that has single fixing points and then the channel runs through them. Although you're sacrificing more depth, there's very little margin for error on the installation. What we've been talking about a lot today with our soundproofing kits and systems is insulation, isolation, and mass. Could you talk about those areas and how important they are when you're specifying acoustic systems? Okay, well, let's let's start with mass, maybe. We talked before about the starting point for acoustic design. So you might have concrete floor structures which are very high in mass. So you've already got a lot of mass in the structure. Adding mass to a separating floor might not be so critical in that situation. You might have a drop ceiling below, layer of board, but the mass of it isn't, yeah, as it isn't highly critical. You might be in a timber floor situation where you haven't got that mass. And then it becomes about adding adding some high mass layers, such as blue plasterboard, your sound block plasterboard, or your fire line plasterboards are ha- higher in mass than your standard plasterboards. And there's other specialist building boards which could add, add, add significant mass to a system. Isolation, it's floating floors, good example. So from an impact sound point of view, you know, you can have a floating floor, which the aim of it effectively is to isolate the floor from the structure below. And likewise, we're doing the same with ceilings. We're using resilient bar ceilings to decouple, isolate as best we can the ceiling from the structure above or an MF ceiling on acoustic hangers. We're isolating those ceiling layers again, independent timber floor and ceiling joists. They are completely separate. Any connections you would want to make sure were as limited as possible and isolated potentially using acoustic hangers you know insulation is good just to dampen down the resonances within the voids good practice mineral wool within within all voids within the structure great well i think we're going to leave it there today thank you very much for joining us today jonathan jonathan and his team at peninsula details will be in the in the link below jonathan offers cpd services um if you're interested in what he's talked about today or any area of acoustics if you're looking for a CPD or if you have a project you wish to discuss with him get in contact with Peninsula and if you've got this far in the video a big round of applause to you for sticking with us and (laughs) there might be even like a secret discount code or something available just for getting this far because (laughs) how many people are still watching us by now but if you did enjoy it then uh give us a comment below and if there's a topic that you'd like us to talk about in the future who knows we might be able to do it again so uh good to see you mate and thanks for coming in and we'll see you soon cheers thank you cheers